Chapters four and five of the Portrait of a Lady by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter four. Mrs. Ludlow was the eldest of the three sisters, and was usually thought the most sensible. The classification being in general that Lillian was the practical one, Edith the beauty, and Isabel the intellectual superior. Mrs. Keyes, in the second of the group, was the wife of an officer of the United States Engineers, and, as our history is not further concerned with her, it will suffice that she was indeed very pretty, and that she formed the ornament of those various military stations, chiefly in the unfashionable West, to which, to her deep chagrin, her husband was successively relegated. Lillian had married a New York lawyer, a young man with a loud voice, and an enthusiasm for his profession. The match was not brilliant any more than Edith's, but Lillian had occasionally been spoken of as a young woman who might be thankful to marry at all. She was so much plainer than her sisters. She was, however, very happy, and now, as the mother of two peremptory little boys, and the mistress of a wedge of brownstone violently driven into Fifty-Third Street, seemed to exult in her condition as in a bold escape. She was short and solid, and her claim to figure was questioned, but she was conceded presence, though not majesty. She had, moreover, as people said, improved since her marriage, and the two things in life of which she was most distinctly conscious were her husband's force and argument, and her sister Isabel's originality. "'I've never kept up with Isabel. It would have taken all my time,' she had often remarked in spite of which, however, she held her rather wistfully in sight, watching her as a motherly spaniel might watch a free greyhound. "'I want to see her safely married. That's what I want to see,' she frequently noted to her husband. "'Well, I must say I should have no particular desire to marry her,' Edmund Ludlow was accustomed to answer, in an extremely audible tone. "'I know you say that for argument,' you always take the opposite ground i don't see what you've got against her except that she's so original well i don't like originals i like translations mr ludlow had more than once replied isabel's written in a foreign tongue i can't make her out she ought to marry an armenian or a portuguese that's just what i'm afraid she'll do cried lillian who thought isabel capable of anything she listened with great interest to the girl's account of Mrs. Touchett's appearance, and in the evening prepared to comply with their aunt's commands. Of what Isabel then said no report has remained, but her sister's words had doubtlessly prompted a word spoken to her husband, as the two were making ready for their visit. "'I do hope immensely she'll do something handsome for Isabel. She has evidently taken a great fancy to her.' "'What is it you wish her to do?' Edmund Ludlow asked. "'Make her a big present?' "'No, indeed, nothing of the sort. But take an interest in her. Sympathize with her. She's evidently just the sort of person to appreciate her. She has lived so much in foreign society. She told Isabel all about it. You know, you've always thought Isabel rather foreign.' "'You want her to give her a little foreign sympathy, eh? Don't you think she gets enough at home?' "'Well, she ought to go abroad,' said Mrs. Ludlow. "'She's just the person to go abroad.' "'And you want the old lady to take her, is that it?' "'She has offered to take her. She's dying to have Isabel go. "'But what I want her to do when she gets her there is to give her all the advantages. "'I'm sure all we've got to do,' said Mrs. Ludlow, "'is to give her a chance.' "'A chance for what?' "'A chance to develop.' "'Oh, Moses!' Edmund Ludlow exclaimed. "'I hope she isn't going to develop any more.' "'If I were not sure you only said that for an argument, "'I should feel very badly,' his wife replied. "'But you know you love her.' "'Do you know I love you?' the young man said jocosely to Isabel a little later, while he brushed his hat. "'I'm sure I don't care whether you do or not,' exclaimed the girl whose voice and smile, however, were less haughty than her words. "'Oh, she feels so grand since Mrs. Touchett's visit,' said her sister. 
but isabel challenged this assertion with a good deal of seriousness you must not say that lily i don't feel grand at all i'm sure there's no harm said the conciliatory lily ah but there's nothing in mrs touchett's visit to make one feel grand oh exclaimed ludlow she's grander than ever whenever i feel grand said the girl it will be for a better reason whether she felt grand or no she at any rate felt different felt as if something had happened to her left to herself for the evening she sat a while under the lamp her hands empty her usual avocations unheeded then she rose and moved about the room and from one room to another preferring the places where the vague lamplight expired she was restless and even agitated at moments she trembled a little the importance of what had happened was out of proportion to its appearance there had really been a change in her life what it would bring with it was as yet extremely indefinite but isabel was in a situation that gave a value to any change she had a desire to leave the past behind her and as she said to herself to begin afresh this desire indeed was not a birth of the present occasion it was as familiar as the sound of the rain upon the window and it had led her to beginning afresh a great many times she closed her eyes as she sat in one of the dusky corners of the quiet parlour but it was not with a desire for dozing forgetfulness it was on the contrary because she felt too wide-eyed and wished to check the sense of seeing too many things at once her imagination was by habit ridiculously active when the door was not open it jumped out of the window she was not accustomed indeed to keep it behind bolts and at important moments when she would have been thankful to make use of her judgment alone she paid the penalty of having given undue encouragement to the faculty of seeing without judging at present with her sense that the note of change had been struck came gradually a host of images of the things she was leaving behind her the years and hours of her life came back to her and for a long time in a stillness broken only by the ticking of the big bronze clock she passed them in review it had been a very happy life and she had been a very fortunate person this was the truth that seemed to emerge most vividly she had had the best of everything and in a world in which the circumstances of so many people made them unenviable it was an advantage never to have known anything particularly unpleasant it appeared to isabel that the unpleasant had been even too absent from her knowledge for she had gathered from her acquaintance with literature that it was often a source of interest and even of instruction her father had kept it away from her her handsome much-loved father who always had such an aversion to it it was a great felicity to have been his daughter isabel rose even to pride in her parentage since his death she had seemed to see him as turning his braver side to his children and as not having managed to ignore the ugly quite so much in practice as in aspiration but this only made her tenderness for him greater it was scarcely even painful to have to suppose him too generous too good-natured too indifferent to sordid considerations many persons had held that he carried this indifference too far especially the large number of those to whom he owed money of their opinions isabel was never very definitely informed but it may interest the reader to know that while they had recognized in the late mr archer a remarkably handsome head and a very taking manner indeed as one of them had said he was always taking something they had declared that he was making a very poor use of his life he had squandered a substantial fortune he had been deplorably convivial he was known to have gambled freely a few very harsh critics went so far to say that he had not even brought up his daughters they had had no regular education and no permanent home they had been at once spoiled and neglected they had lived with nursemaids and governesses usually very bad ones or had been sent to superficial schools kept by the french from which at the end of a month 
they had been removed in tears this view of the matter would have excited isabel's indignation for to her own sense her opportunities had been large even when her father had left his daughters for three months at neuchatel with a french bonne who had eloped with a russian nobleman staying at the same hotel even in this irregular situation an incident of the girl's eleventh year she had been neither frightened nor ashamed but had thought it a romantic episode in a liberal education her father had a large way of looking at life of which his restlessness and even his occasional incoherency of conduct had been only a proof he wished his daughters even his children to see as much of the world as possible and it was for this purpose that before isabel was fourteen he had transported them three times across the atlantic giving them on each occasion however but a few months view of the subject proposed a course which had whetted our heroine's curiosity without enabling her to satisfy it she ought to have been a partisan of her father for she was the member of his trio who most made up to him for the disagreeables he didn't mention in his last days his general willingness to take leave of a world in which the difficulty of doing so as one liked appeared to increase as one grew older had been sensibly modified by the pain of separation from his clever his superior his remarkable girl later when the journeys to europe had ceased he still had shown his children all sorts of indulgence and if he had been troubled about money matters nothing ever disturbed their irreflective consciousness of many possessions isabel though she danced very well had not the recollection of having been in new york a successful member of the choreographic circle her sister edith was as every one said so very much more fetching edith was so striking an example of success that isabel could have no illusions as to what constituted this advantage or as to the limits of her own power to frisk and jump and shriek above all with rightness of effect nineteen persons out of twenty including the younger sister herself pronounced edith infinitely the prettier of the two but the twentieth besides reversing this judgment had the entertainment of thinking all the others aesthetic vulgarians isabel had in the depths of her nature an even more unquenchable desire to please than edith but the depths of this young lady's nature were a very out-of-the-way place between which and the surface communication was interrupted by a dozen capricious forces she saw the young men who came in large numbers to see her sister but as a general thing they were afraid of her they had a belief that some special preparation was required for talking with her her reputation of reading a great deal hung about her like the cloudy envelope of a goddess in an epic it was supposed to engender difficult questions and to keep the conversation at a low temperature the poor girl liked to be thought clever but she hated to be thought bookish she used to read in secret and though her memory was excellent to abstain from showy reference she had a great desire for knowledge but she really preferred almost any source of information to the printed page she had an immense curiosity about life and was constantly staring and wondering she carried within herself a great fund of life and her deepest enjoyment was to feel the continuity between the movements of her own soul and the agitations of the world for this reason she was fond of seeing great crowds and large stretches of country of reading about revolutions and wars of looking at historical pictures a class of efforts as to which she had often committed the conscious solecism of forgiving them much bad painting for the sake of the subject while the civil war was on she was still a very young girl but she passed months of this long period in a state of almost passionate excitement in which she felt herself at times to her extreme confusion stirred almost indiscriminately by the valour of either army of course the circumspection of suspicious swains had never gone the length of making her a social proscript for the number of those whose hearts as they approached her 
beat only just fast enough to remind them they had heads as well, had kept her unacquainted with the supreme disciplines of her sex and age. She had had everything a girl could have, kindness, admiration, bonbons, bouquets, the sense of exclusion from none of the privileges of the world she lived in, abundant opportunity for dancing, plenty of new dresses, the London Spectator, the latest publications, the music of Gounod, the poetry of Browning, the prose of George Eliot. These things now, as memory played over them, resolved themselves into a multitude of scenes and figures. Forgotten things came back to her. Many others, which she had lately thought of great moment, dropped out of sight. The result was kaleidoscopic, but the movement of the instrument was checked at last by the servants coming in with the name of a gentleman. The name of the gentleman was Caspar Goodwood. He was a straight young man from Boston, who had known Miss Archer for the last twelve months, and who, thinking her the most beautiful young woman of her time, had pronounced the time, according to the rule I have hinted at, a foolish period of history. He sometimes wrote to her, and had within a week or two written from New York. She had thought it very possible he would come in, had indeed all the rainy day been vaguely expecting him. Now that she learned he was there, nevertheless, she felt no eagerness to receive him. He was the finest young man she had ever seen, and indeed quite a splendid young man. He inspired her with a sentiment of high, of rare respect. She had never felt equally moved to it by any other person. He was supposed by the world in general to wish to marry her, but this, of course, was between themselves. It at least may be affirmed that he had travelled from New York to Albany expressly to see her, having learned in the former city, where he was spending a few days, and where he had hoped to find her, that she was still at the state capital. Isabel delayed for some minutes to go to him. She moved about the room with a new sense of complications. But at last she presented herself, and found him standing near the lamp. He was tall, strong, and somewhat stiff. He was also lean and brown. He was not romantically, he was much rather obscurely handsome. But his physiognomy had an air of requesting your attention, which it rewarded according to the charm you found in the blue eyes of remarkable fixedness, the eyes of a complexion other than his own, and a jaw of the somewhat angular mould which is supposed to bespeak resolution. Isabel said to herself that it bespoke resolution to-night, in spite of which, in half an hour, Caspar Goodwood, who had arrived hopeful as well as resolute, took his way back to his lodging with the feeling of a man defeated. He was not, it may be added, a man weakly to accept defeat. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 Ralph Touchett was a philosopher, but nevertheless he knocked at his mother's door, at a quarter to seven, with a good deal of eagerness. Even philosophers have their preferences, and it must be admitted that of his progenitors his father ministered most to his sense of the sweetness of filial dependence. His father, as he had often said to himself, was the more motherly. His mother, on the other hand, was paternal and even, according to the slang of the day, gubernatorial. She was nevertheless very fond of her only child, and had always insisted on his spending three months of the year with her. Ralph rendered perfect justice to her affection, and knew that in her thoughts and her thoroughly arranged and servanted life, his turn always came after the other nearest subjects of her solicitude, the various punctualities of performance of the workers of her will. He found her completely dressed for dinner, but she embraced her boy with her gloved hands and made him sit on the sofa beside her. She inquired very scrupulously about her husband's health and about the young man's own, and receiving no very brilliant account of either, remarked that she was more than ever convinced of her wisdom in not exposing herself to the English climate. In this case she also might have given way. Ralph smiled at the idea of his mother's giving way, but made no point of reminding her 
that his own infirmity was not the result of the english climate from which he absented himself for a considerable part of each year he had been a very small boy when his father daniel tracy touchett a native of rutland in the state of vermont came to england a subordinate partner in a banking house where some ten years later he gained preponderant control daniel touchett saw before him a lifelong residence in his adopted country of which from the first he took a simple sane and accommodating view but as he said to himself he had no intention of disamericanizing nor had he a desire to teach his only son any such subtle art it had been for himself so very soluble a problem to live in england assimilated yet unconverted that it seemed to him equally simple his lawful heir should after his death carry on the grey old bank in the white american light he was at pains to intensify this light however by sending the boy home for his education ralph spent several terms at an american school and took a degree at an american university after which as he struck his father on his return as even redundantly native he was placed for some three years in residence at oxford oxford swallowed up harvard and ralph became at last english enough his outward conformity to the manners that surrounded him was none the less the mask of a mind that greatly enjoyed its independence on which nothing long imposed itself and which naturally inclined to adventure and irony indulged in a boundless liberty of appreciation he began with being a young man of promise at oxford he distinguished himself to his father's ineffable satisfaction and the people about him said it was a thousand pities so clever a fellow should be shut out from a career he might have had a career by returning to his own country though this point is shrouded in uncertainty and even if mr touchett had been willing to part with him which was not the case it would have gone hard with him to put a watery waste permanently between himself and the old man whom he regarded as his best friend ralph was not only fond of his father he admired him he enjoyed the opportunity of observing him daniel touchett to his perception was a man of genius and though he himself had no aptitude for the banking mystery he made a point of learning enough of it to measure the great figure his father had played it was not this however he mainly relished it was the fine ivory surface polished as by the english air that the old man had opposed to possibilities of penetration daniel touchett had been neither at harvard nor at oxford and it was his own fault if he had placed in his son's hands the key to modern criticism ralph whose head was full of ideas which his father had never guessed had a high esteem for the latter's originality americans rightly or wrongly are commended for the ease with which they adapt themselves to foreign conditions but mr touchett had made of the very limits of his pliancy half the ground of his general success he had retained in their freshness most of his marks of primary pressure his tone as his son always noted with pleasure was that of the more luxuriant parts of new england at the end of his life he had become on his own ground as mellow as he was rich he combined consummate shrewdness with the disposition superficially to fraternize and his social position on which he had never wasted a care had the firm perfection of an unthumbed fruit it was perhaps his want of imagination and of what is called the historic consciousness but to many of the impressions usually made by english life upon the cultivated stranger his sense was completely closed there were certain differences he had never perceived certain habits he had never formed certain obscurities he had never sounded as regards these latter on the day he had sounded them his son would have thought less well of him ralph on leaving oxford had spent a couple of years in travelling after which he had found himself perched on a high stool in his father's bank the responsibility and honour of such positions is not i believe measured by the height of the stool which depends upon other considerations 
ralph indeed who had very long legs was fond of standing and even of walking about at his work to this exercise however he was obliged to devote but a limited period for at the end of some eighteen months he had become aware of his being seriously out of health he had caught a violent cold which fixed itself on his lungs and threw them into dire confusion he had to give up work and apply to the letter the sorry injunction to take care of himself at first he slighted the task it appeared to him it was not himself in the least he was taking care of but an uninteresting and uninterested person with whom he had nothing in common this person however improved on acquaintance and ralph grew at last to have a certain grudging tolerance even an undemonstrative respect for him misfortune makes strange bedfellows and our young man feeling that he had something at stake in the matter it usually struck him as his reputation for ordinary wit devoted to his graceless charge an amount of attention of which note was duly taken and which had at least the effect of keeping the poor fellow alive one of his lungs began to heal the other promised to follow its example and he was assured that he might outweather a dozen winters if he would betake himself to those climates in which consumptives chiefly congregate as he had grown extremely fond of london he cursed the flatness of exile but at the same time that he cursed he conformed and gradually when he found his sensitive organ grateful even for grim favours he conferred them with a lighter hand he wintered abroad as the phrase is basked in the sun stopped at home when the wind blew went to bed when it rained and once or twice when it had snowed overnight almost never got up again a secret hoard of indifference like a thick cake a fond old nurse might have slipped into his first school outfit came to his aid and helped to reconcile him to sacrifice since at best he was too ill for aught but that arduous game as he said to himself there was really nothing he had wanted very much to do so that he had at least not renounced the field of valour at present however the fragrance of forbidden fruit seemed occasionally to float past him and remind him that the finest of pleasures is the rush of action living as he now lived was like reading a good book in a poor translation a meagre entertainment for a young man who felt that he might have been an excellent linguist he had good winters and poor winters and while the former lasted he was sometimes the sport of a vision of virtual recovery but this vision was dispelled some three years before the occurrence of the incidents with which this history opens he had on that occasion remained later than usual in england and had been overtaken by bad weather before reaching algiers he arrived more dead than alive and lay there for several weeks between life and death his convalescence was a miracle but the first use he made of it was to assure himself that such miracles happened but once he said to himself that his hour was in sight and that it behooved him to keep his eyes upon it yet that it was also open to him to spend the interval as agreeably as might be consistent with such a preoccupation with the prospect of losing them the simple use of his faculties became an exquisite pleasure it seemed to him the joys of contemplation had never been sounded he was far from the time when he had found it hard that he should be obliged to give up the idea of distinguishing himself an idea none the less importunate for being vague and none the less delightful for having had to struggle in the same breast with bursts of inspiring self-criticism his friends at present judged him more cheerful and attributed it to a theory over which they shook their heads knowingly that he would recover his health his serenity was but the array of wild flowers niched in his ruin it was very probably this sweet tasting property of the observed thing in itself that was mainly concerned in ralph's quickly stirred interest in the advent of a young lady who was evidently not insipid if he was consideringly disposed something told him here was occupation enough for a succession of days it may be added in summary that the imagination of loving as distinguished from that of being loved 
had still a place in his reduced sketch he had only forbidden himself the riot of expression however he shouldn't inspire his cousin with a passion nor would she be able even should she try to help him to one and now tell me about the young lady he said to his mother what do you mean to do with her mrs touchett was prompt i mean to ask your father to invite her to stay three or four weeks at garden court you needn't stand on any such ceremony as that said ralph my father will ask her as a matter of course i don't know about that she's my niece she's not his good lord dear mother what a sense of property that's all the more reason for his asking her but after that i mean after three months for it's absurd asking the poor girl to remain but for three or four paltry weeks what do you mean to do with her i mean to take her to paris i mean to get her clothing ah yes that's of course but independently of that i shall invite her to spend the autumn with me in florence you don't rise above detail dear mother said ralph i should like to know what you mean to do with her in a general way my duty mrs touchett declared i suppose you pity her very much she added no i don't think i pity her she doesn't strike me as inviting compassion i think i envy her before being sure however give me a hint of where you see your duty in showing her four european countries i shall leave her the choice of two of them and in giving her the opportunity of perfecting herself in french which she already knows very well ralph frowned a little that sounds rather dry even allowing her the choice of two of the countries if it's dry said his mother with a laugh you can leave isabel alone to water it she is as good as a summer rain any day do you mean she's a gifted being i don't know whether she's a gifted being but she's a clever girl with a strong will and a high temper she has no idea of being bored i can imagine that said ralph and then he added abruptly how do you two get on do you mean by that that i'm a bore i don't think she finds me one some girls might i know but isabel's too clever for that i think i greatly amuse her we get on because i understand her i know the sort of girl she is she's very frank and i'm very frank we know just what to expect of each other ah dear mother ralph exclaimed one always knows what to expect of you you've never surprised me but once and that's to-day in presenting me with a pretty cousin whose existence i had never suspected do you think her so very pretty very pretty indeed but i don't insist upon that it's her general air of being some one in particular that strikes me who is this rare creature and what is she where did you find her and how did you make her acquaintance i found her in an old house at albany sitting in a dreary room on a rainy day reading a heavy book and boring herself to death she didn't know she was bored but when i left her no doubt of it she seemed very grateful for the service you may say i shouldn't have enlightened her i should have let her alone there's a good deal in that but i acted conscientiously i thought she was meant for something better it occurred to me that it would be a kindness to take her about and introduce her to the world she thinks she knows a great deal of it like most american girls but like most american girls she's ridiculously mistaken if you want to know i thought she would do me credit i like to be well thought of and for a woman of my age there's no greater convenience in some ways than an attractive niece you know i had seen nothing of my sister's children for years i disapproved entirely of the father but i always meant to do something for them when he should have gone to his reward i ascertained where they were to be found and without any preliminaries went and introduced myself there were two others of them both of whom are married but i saw only the elder who has by the way a very uncivil husband the wife whose name is lily jumped at the idea of my taking an interest in isabel she said it was just what her sister needed that someone should take an interest in her 
she spoke of her as you might speak of some young person of genius in want of encouragement and patronage it may be that isabel's a genius but in that case i've not yet learned her special line mrs ludlow was especially keen about my taking her to europe they all regard europe over there as a land of emigration of rescue a refuge for their superfluous population isabel herself seemed very glad to come and the thing was easily arranged there was a little difficulty about the money question as she seemed averse to being under pecuniary obligations but she has a small income and she supposes herself to be travelling at her own expense ralph had listened attentively to this judicious report by which his interest in the subject of it was not impaired ah if she's a genius he said we must find out her special line is it by chance for flirting i don't think so you may suspect that at first but you'll be wrong you won't i think in any way be easily right about her warburton's wrong then ralph rejoicingly exclaimed he flatters himself that he has made that discovery his mother shook her head lord warburton won't understand her he needn't try he's very intelligent said ralph but it's right he should be puzzled once in a while isabel will enjoy puzzling a lord mrs touchett remarked her son frowned a little what does she know about lords nothing at all that will puzzle him all the more ralph greeted these words with a laugh and looked out the window then are you not going down to see my father he asked at a quarter to eight said mrs touchett her son looked at his watch you've another quarter of an hour then tell me some more about isabel after which as mrs touchett declined his invitation declaring that he must find out for himself well he pursued she'll certainly do you credit but won't she also give you trouble i hope not but if she does i shall not shrink from it i never do that she strikes me as very natural said ralph natural people are not the most trouble no said ralph you yourself are a proof of that you're extremely natural and i'm sure you have never troubled any one it takes trouble to do that but tell me this it just occurs to me is isabel capable of making herself disagreeable ah cried his mother you ask too many questions find that out for yourself his questions however were not exhausted all this time he said you've not told me what you intend to do with her do with her you talk as if she were a yard of calico i shall do absolutely nothing with her and she herself will do everything she chooses she gave me notice of that what you meant then in your telegram was that her character's independent i never know what i mean in my telegrams especially those i send from america clearness is too expensive come down to your father it's not yet a quarter to eight said ralph i must allow for his impatience mrs touchett answered ralph knew what to think of his father's impatience but making no rejoinder he offered his mother his arm this put it in his power as they descended together to stop her a moment on the middle landing of the staircase the broad low wide-armed staircase of time-blackened oak which was one of the most striking features of garden court you've no plan of marrying her he smiled marrying her i should be sorry to play her such a trick but apart from that she's perfectly able to marry herself she has every facility do you mean to say she has a husband picked out i don't know about a husband but there's a young man in boston ralph went on he had no desire to hear about the young man in boston as my father says they're always engaged his mother had told him that he must satisfy his curiosity at the source and it soon became evident he should not want for occasion he had a good deal of talk with his young kinswoman when the two had been left together in the drawing-room lord warburton who had ridden over from his own house some ten miles distant remounted and took his departure before dinner and an hour after this meal was ended mr and mrs touchett 
who appeared to have quite emptied the measure of their forms, withdrew, under the valid pretext of fatigue, to their respective apartments. The young man spent an hour with his cousin. Though she had been travelling half the day, she appeared in no degree spent. She was really tired, she knew it, and knew she should pay for it on the morrow. But it was her habit at this period to carry exhaustion to its furthest point, and confess to it only when dissimulation broke down. A fine hypocrisy was for the present possible. She was interested, she was, as she said to herself, floated. She asked Ralph to show her the pictures. There were a great many in the house, most of them of his own choosing. The best were arranged in an oaken gallery of charming proportions, which had a sitting-room at either end of it, and which in the evening was usually lighted. The light was insufficient to show the pictures to advantage, and the visit might have stood over to the morrow. This suggestion Ralph had ventured to make, but Isabel looked disappointed, smiling still, however, and said, "'If you please, I should like to see them just a little.' She was eager, she knew she was eager, and now seemed so. She couldn't help it. "'She doesn't take suggestions,' Ralph said to himself, but he said it without irritation. Her pressure amused and even pleased him. The lamps were on brackets at intervals, and if the light was imperfect it was genial. It fell upon the vague squares of rich colour, and on the faded gilding of heavy frames. It made a sheen on the polished floor of the gallery. Ralph took a candlestick, and moved about, pointing out the things he liked. Isabel, inclining to one picture after another, indulged in little exclamations and murmurs. She was evidently a judge. She had a natural taste. He was struck with that. She took a candlestick herself, and held it slowly here and there. She lifted it high, and as she did so, he found himself pausing in the middle of the place, and bending his eyes much less upon the pictures than on her presence. He lost nothing in truth by these wandering glances, for she was better worth looking at than most works of art. She was undeniably spare, and ponderably light, and provably tall. When people had wished to distinguish her from the other two Miss Archers, they had always called her the willowy one. Her hair, which was dark even to blackness, had been an object of envy to many women. Her light grey eyes, a little too firm perhaps in her graver moments, had an enchanting range of concession. They walked slowly up one side of the gallery and down the other, and then she said, "'Well, now I know more than I did when I began.' "'You apparently have a great passion for knowledge,' her cousin returned. "'I think I have. Most girls are horridly ignorant.' "'You strike me as different from most girls.' "'Ah, some of them would, but the way they're talked about,' murmured Isabel, who preferred not to dilate just yet on herself. Then, in a moment, to change the subject, "'Please tell me, isn't there a ghost?' she went on. "'A ghost?' "'A castle spectre, a thing that appears. We call them ghosts in America.' "'So we do here when we see them.' "'You do see them, then? You ought to, in this romantic old house.' "'It's not a romantic old house,' said Ralph. "'You'll be disappointed if you count on that. It's a dismally prosaic one. There's no romance here, but what you may have brought with you.' I've brought a great deal, but it seems to me I've brought it to the right place. To keep it out of harm, certainly. Nothing will ever happen to it here, between my father and me. Isabel looked at him for a moment. Is there never any one here but your father and you? Uh, my mother, of course. Oh, I know your mother. She's not romantic. Haven't you other people? Very few. I'm sorry for that. I like so much to see people. "'Oh, we'll invite all the county to amuse you,' said Ralph. "'Now you're making fun of me,' the girl answered rather gravely. "'Who was the gentleman on the lawn when I arrived?' "'A county neighbour. He doesn't come very often.' "'I'm sorry for that. I liked him,' said Isabel. "'Why, it seemed to me that you barely spoke to him,' Ralph objected. "'Never mind. I like him all the same. I like your father, too, immensely.' 
"'You can't do better than that. "'He's the dearest of the dear.' "'I'm so sorry he's ill,' said Isabel. "'You must help me to nurse him. "'You ought to be a good nurse.' "'I don't think I am. "'I've been told I'm not. "'I'm said to have too many theories. "'But you haven't told me about the ghost,' she added. "'Ralph, however, gave no heed to this observation. "'You like my father, and you like Lord Warburton. "'I infer also that you like my mother.' I like your mother very much, because, because, and Isabel found herself attempting to assign a reason for her affection for Mrs. Touchett. Ah, we never know why, said her companion, laughing. I always know, the girl answered. It's because she doesn't expect one to like her. She doesn't care whether one does or not. So you adore her, out of perversity? Well, I take greatly after my mother, said Ralph. I don't believe you do at all. You wish people to like you, and you try to make them do it. Good heavens, how you see through one, he cried, with a dismay that was not altogether jocular. But I like you all the same, his cousin went on. The way to clinch the matter will be to show me the ghost. Ralph shook his head sadly. I might show it to you, but you'd never see it. The privilege isn't given to every one. It's not enviable. It has never been seen by a young, happy, innocent person like you. You must have suffered first, have suffered greatly, have gained some miserable knowledge. In that way, your eyes are open to it. I saw it long ago, said Ralph. I told you just now I'm very fond of knowledge, Isabel answered. Yes, of happy knowledge, of pleasant knowledge. But you haven't suffered, and you're not made to suffer. I hope you'll never see the ghost. She had listened to him attentively, with a smile on her lips, but with a certain gravity in her eyes. Charming as he found her, she had struck him as rather presumptuous. Indeed, it was a part of her charm, and he wondered what she would say. "'I'm not afraid, you know,' she said, which seemed quite presumptuous enough. "'You're not afraid of suffering?' "'Yes, I'm afraid of suffering, but I'm not afraid of ghosts.' and I think people suffer too easily, she said. I don't believe you do, said Ralph, looking at her with his hands in his pockets. I don't think that's a fault, she answered. It's not absolutely necessary to suffer. We were not made for that. You were not, certainly. I'm not speaking of myself, and she wandered off a little. No, it isn't a fault, said her cousin. It's a merit to be strong. Only, if you don't suffer, they call you hard, Isabel remarked. They passed out of the smaller drawing-room, into which they had returned from the gallery, and paused in the hall at the foot of the staircase. Here Ralph presented his companion with her bedroom candle, which he had taken from a niche. Never mind what they call you. When you do suffer, they call you an idiot. The great point's to be as happy as possible. She looked at him a little. She had taken her candle and placed her foot on the oaken stair. Well, she said, that's what I came to Europe for, to be as happy as possible. Good night. Good night. I wish you all success, and shall be very glad to contribute to it. She turned away, and he watched her as she slowly ascended. Then, with his hands always in his pockets, he went back to the empty drawing-room. End of chapter 5《6 and 7 of Portrait of a Lady by Henry James This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Isabel Archer was a young person of many theories her imagination was remarkably active it had been her fortune to possess a finer mind than most of the persons among whom her lot was cast, to have a larger perception of surrounding facts, and to care for knowledge that was tinged with the unfamiliar. It was true that among her contemporaries she passed for a young woman of extraordinary profundity, for these excellent people never withheld their admiration from a reach of intellect of which they themselves were not conscious, and spoke of Isabel as a prodigy of learning, a creature reported to have read the classic authors, in translations. 
Her paternal aunt, Mrs. Varian, once spread the rumour that Isabel was writing a book, Mrs. Varian having a reverence for books, and averred that the girl would distinguish herself in print. Mrs. Varian thought highly of literature, for which she entertained that esteem that is connected with a sense of privation. Her own large house, remarkable for its assortment of mosaic tables and decorated ceilings, was unfurnished with a library, and in the way of printed volumes contained nothing but half a dozen novels and paper on a shelf in the apartment of one of the Miss Varians. Practically, Mrs. Varian's acquaintance with literature was confined to the New York interviewer. As she very justly said, after you had read the interviewer, you had lost all faith in culture. Her tendency with this was rather to keep the interviewer out of the way of her daughters. She was determined to bring them up properly, and they read nothing at all. Her impression with regard to Isabel's labours was quite illusory. The girl had never attempted to write a book, and had no desire for the laurels of authorship. She had no talent for expression, and too little of the consciousness of genius. She only had a general idea that people were right, when they treated her as if she were rather superior. Whether or no she were superior, people were right in admiring her if they thought her so. For it seemed to her often that her mind moved more quickly than theirs, and this encouraged an impatience that might easily be confounded with superiority. It may be affirmed without delay that Isabel was probably very liable to the sin of self-esteem. She often surveyed with complacency the field of her own nature. She was in the habit of taking for granted, on scanty evidence, that she was right. She treated herself to occasions of homage. Meanwhile, her errors and delusions were frequently such as a biographer, interested in preserving the dignity of his subject, must shrink from specifying. Her thoughts were a tangle of vague outlines, which had never been corrected by the judgment of people speaking with authority. In matters of opinion, she had had her own way, and it had led her into a thousand ridiculous zigzags. At moments she discovered she was grotesquely wrong and then she treated herself to a week of passionate humility. After this she held her head higher than ever again, for it was of no use, she had an unquenchable desire to think well of herself. She had a theory that it was only under this provision life was worth living, that one should be one of the best, should be conscious of a fine organization, she couldn't help knowing her organization was fine, should move in a realm of light, of natural wisdom, of happy impulse, of inspiration gracefully chronic. It was almost as necessary to cultivate doubt of one's self as to cultivate doubt of one's best friend. One should try to be one's own best friend, and to give one's self, in this manner, distinguished company. The girl had a certain nobleness of imagination, which rendered her a good many services, and played her a great many tricks. She spent half her time in thinking of beauty and bravery and magnanimity. She had a fixed determination to regard the world as a place of brightness, of free expansion, of irresistible action. She held it must be detestable to be afraid or ashamed. She had an infinite hope that she should never do anything wrong. She had resented so strongly, after discovering them, her mere errors of feeling, the discovery always made her tremble, as if she had escaped from a trap which might have caught her and smothered her, that the chance of inflicting a sensible injury upon another person, presented only as a contingency, caused her at moments to hold her breath. That always struck her as the worst thing that could happen to her. On the whole, reflectively, she was in no uncertainty about the things that were wrong. She had no love of their look, but when she fixed them hard, she recognized them. It was wrong to be mean, to be jealous, to be false, to be cruel. She had seen very little of the evil of the world, but she had seen women who lied and who tried to hurt each other. Seeing such things had quickened her high spirit. It seemed indecent not to scorn them. Of course, the danger of a high spirit was the danger of inconsistency the danger of keeping up the flag after the place is surrendered, a sort of behaviour so crooked as to be almost a dishonour to the flag. 
but isabel who knew little of the sorts of artillery to which young women are exposed flattered herself that such contradictions would never be noted in her own conduct her life should always be in harmony with the most pleasing impression she should produce she would be what she appeared and she would appear what she was sometimes she went so far as to wish that she might find herself some day in a difficult position so that they should have the pleasure of being as heroic as the occasion demanded altogether with her meagre knowledge her inflated ideals her confidence at once innocent and dogmatic her temper at once exacting and indulgent her mixture of curiosity and fastidiousness of vivacity and indifference her desire to look very well and to be if possible even better her determination to see to try to know her combination of the delicate desultory flame-like spirit and the eager and personal creature of conditions she would be an easy victim of scientific criticism if she were not intended to awaken on the reader's part an impulse more tender and more purely expectant it was one of her theories that isabel archer was very fortunate in being independent and that she ought to make some very enlightened use of that state she never called it the state of solitude much less of singleness she thought such descriptions weak and besides her sister lily constantly urged her to come and abide she had a friend whose acquaintance she had made shortly before her father's death who offered so high an example of useful activity that isabel always thought of her as a model henrietta stackpole had the advantage of an admired ability she was thoroughly launched in journalism and her letters to the interviewer from washington newport the white mountains and other places were universally quoted isabel pronounced them with confidence ephemeral but she esteemed the courage energy and good humour of the writer who without parents and without property had adopted three of the children of an infirm and widowed sister and was paying their school bills out of the proceeds of her literary labour henrietta was in the van of progress and had clear-cut ideas on most subjects her cherished desire had long been to come to europe and to write a series of letters to the interviewer from the radical point of view an enterprise the less difficult as she knew perfectly in advance what her opinions would be and to how many objections most european institutions lay open when she heard that isabel was coming she wished to start at once thinking naturally that it would be delightful the two should travel together she had been obliged however to postpone this enterprise she thought isabel a glorious creature and had spoken of her covertly in some of her letters though she never mentioned the fact to her friend who would not have taken pleasure in it and was not a regular student of the interviewer henrietta for isabel was chiefly a proof that a woman might suffice to herself and be happy her resources were of the obvious kind but even if one had not the journalistic talent and a genius for guessing as henrietta said what the public was going to want one was not therefore to conclude that one had no vocation no beneficent aptitude of any sort and resign oneself to being frivolous and hollow isabel was stoutly determined not to be hollow if one should wait with the right patience one would find some happy work to one's hand of course among her theories this young lady was not without a collection of views on the subject of marriage the first on the list was a conviction of the vulgarity of thinking too much of it from lapsing into eagerness on this point she earnestly prayed she might be delivered she held that a woman ought to be able to live to herself in the absence of exceptional flimsiness and that it was perfectly possible to be happy without the society of a more or less coarse-minded person of another sex the girl's prayer was very sufficiently answered something pure and proud that there was in her something cold and dry an unappreciated suitor with a taste for analysis might have called it had hitherto kept her from any great vanity of conjecture on the article of possible husbands few of the men she saw seemed worth a ruinous expenditure and it made her smile to think that one of them should present himself as an incentive to hope and a reward of patience 
deep in her soul it was the deepest thing there lay a belief that if a certain light should dawn she could give herself completely but this image on the whole was too formidable to be attractive isabel's thoughts hovered about it but they seldom rested on it long after a little it ended in alarms it often seemed to her that she thought too much about herself you could have made her colour any day in the year by calling her a rank egoist she was always planning out her development desiring her perfection observing her progress her nature had in her conceit a certain garden-like quality a suggestion of perfume and murmuring boughs of shady bowers and lengthening vistas which made her feel that introspection was after all an exercise in the open air and that a visit to the recesses of one's spirit was harmless when one returned from it with a lap full of roses but she was often reminded that there were other gardens in the world than those of her remarkable soul and that there were moreover a great many places which were not gardens at all only dusky pestiferous tracts planted thick with ugliness and misery in the current of that repaid curiosity on which he had lately been floating which had conveyed her to this beautiful old england and might carry her much further still she often checked herself with the thought of the thousands of people who were less happy than herself a thought which for the moment made her fine full consciousness appear a kind of immodesty what should one do with the misery of the world in a scheme of the agreeable for oneself it must be confessed that this question never held her long she was too young too impatient to live too unacquainted with pain she always returned to her theory that a young woman whom after all every one thought clever should begin by getting a general impression of life this impression was necessary to prevent mistakes and after it should be secured she might make the unfortunate condition of others a subject of special attention england was a revelation to her and she found herself as diverted as a child at a pantomime in her infantine excursions to europe she had seen only the continent and had seen it from the nursery window paris not london was her father's mecca and into many of interests there his children had naturally not entered the images of that time moreover had grown faint and remote and the old world quality in everything that she now saw had all the charm of strangeness her uncle's house seemed a picture made real no refinement of the agreeable was lost upon isabel the rich perfection of garden court at once revealed a world and gratified a need the large low rooms with brown ceilings and dusky corners the deep embrasures and curious casements the quiet light on dark polished panels the deep greenness outside that seemed always peeping in the sense of well-ordered privacy in the centre of a property a place where sounds were felicitously accidental where the tread was muffled by the earth itself and in the thick mild air all friction dropped out of contact and all shrillness out of talk these things were much to the taste of our young lady whose taste played a considerable role in her emotions she formed a fast friendship with her uncle and often sat by his chair when he had had it moved out to the lawn he passed hours in the open air sitting with folded hands like a placid homely household god a god of service who had done his work and received his wages and was trying to grow used to weeks and months made up only of off days isabel amused him more than she suspected the effect she produced upon people was often different from what she supposed and he frequently gave himself the pleasure of making her chatter it was by this term that he qualified her conversation which had much of the point observable in that of the young ladies of her country to whom the ear of the world is more directly presented than to their sisters in other lands like the mass of american girls isabel had been encouraged to express herself her remarks had been attended to she had been expected to have emotions and opinions 
Many of her opinions had doubtless but a slender value. Many of her emotions passed away in the utterance. But they had left a trace in giving her the habit of seeming at least to feel and think, and in imparting moreover to her words, when she was really touched, that prompt vividness which so many people had regarded as a sign of superiority. Mr. Touchett used to think that she reminded him of his wife when his wife was in her teens. It was because she was fresh and natural and quick to understand, to speak, so many characteristics of her niece, that he had fallen in love with Mrs. Touchett. He never expressed this analogy to the girl herself, however, for if Mrs. Touchett had once been like Isabel, Isabel was not at all like Mrs. Touchett. The old man was full of kindness for her. It was a long time, as he said, since they had had any young life in the house, and our rustling, quickly moving, clear-voiced heroine was as agreeable to his sense as the sound of flowing water. He wanted to do something for her, and wished she would ask it of him. She would ask nothing but questions. It is true that of these she asked a quantity. Her uncle had a great fund of answers, though her pressure sometimes came in forms that puzzled him. She questioned him immensely about England, about the British Constitution, the English character, the state of politics, the manners and customs of the royal family, the peculiarities of the aristocracy, the way of living and thinking of his neighbours, and in begging to be enlightened on these points, she usually inquired whether they corresponded with the descriptions in the books. The old man always looked at her a little with his fine dry smile, while he smoothed down the shawl spread across his legs. The books, he once said, well, I don't know much about the books. You must ask Ralph about that. I've always ascertained for myself, got my information in the natural form. I never asked many questions, even. I just kept quiet and took notice. Of course, I've had very good opportunities, better than what a young lady would naturally have. I'm of an inquisitive disposition, though you mightn't think it if you were to watch me. However much you might watch me, I should be watching you more. I've been watching these people for upwards of thirty-five years, and I don't hesitate to say that I've acquired considerable information. It's a very fine country on the whole, finer perhaps than what we give it credit for on the other side. There are several improvements I should like to see introduced, but the necessity of them doesn't seem to be generally felt as yet. When the necessity of a thing is generally felt, they usually manage to accomplish it but they seem to feel pretty comfortable about waiting till then. I certainly feel more at home among them than I expected to when I first came over. I suppose it's because I've had a considerable degree of success. When you're successful, you naturally feel more at home. Do you suppose that if I'm successful, I shall feel at home? Isabel asked. I should think it very probable, and you certainly will be successful. They like American young ladies very much over here. They show them a great deal of kindness. But you mustn't feel too much at home, you know. Oh, I'm by no means sure it will satisfy me, Isabel judicially emphasized. I like the place very much, but I'm not sure I shall like the people. The people are very good people, especially if you like them. I've no doubt they're good, Isabel rejoined. But are they pleasant in society? They won't rob me nor beat me, but will they make themselves agreeable to me? That's what I like people to do. I don't hesitate to say so, because I always appreciate it. I don't believe they're very nice to girls. They're not nice to them in the novels. I don't know about the novels, said Mr. Touchett. I believe the novels have a great deal of ability, but I don't suppose they're very accurate. We once had a lady who wrote novels staying here, she was a friend of Ralph's, and he asked her down. She was very positive, quite up to everything, but she was not the sort of person you could depend on for evidence. Too free a fancy, I suppose that was it. She afterwards published a work of fiction in which she was understood to have given a representation, something in the nature of a caricature, as you might say, of my unworthy self. I didn't read it but Ralph just handed me the book with the principal passages marked. It was understood to be a description of my conversation. 
American peculiarities, nasal twang, Yankee notions, stars and stripes. Well, it was not at all accurate. She couldn't have listened very attentively. I had no objection to her giving a report of my conversation if she liked, but I didn't like the idea that she hadn't taken the trouble to listen to it. Of course, I talk like an American. I can't talk like a Hottentot. However I talk, I've made them understand me pretty well over here. But I don't talk like the old gentleman in that lady's novel. He wasn't an American. We wouldn't have him over there at any price. I just mention that fact to show you that they're not always accurate. Of course, as I've no daughters, and as Mrs. Touchett resides in Florence, I haven't had much chance to notice about the young ladies. It sometimes appears as if the young women in the lower class were not very well treated, but I guess their position is better in the upper, and even to some extent in the middle. Gracious! Isabel exclaimed. How many classes have they? About fifty, I suppose. Well, I don't know that I ever counted them. I never took much notice of the classes. That's the advantage of being an American here. You don't belong to any class. I hope so, said Isabel. Imagine one's belonging to an English class. Well, I guess some of them are pretty comfortable, especially towards the top. But for me, there are only two classes, the people I trust and the people I don't. Of those two, my dear Isabel, you belong to the first. I'm much obliged to you, said the girl quickly. Her way of taking compliments seemed sometimes rather dry. She got rid of them as rapidly as possible. But as regards this, she was sometimes misjudged. She was thought insensible to them, whereas in fact she was simply unwilling to show how infinitely they pleased her. To show that was to show too much. I'm sure the English are very conventional, she added. They've got everything pretty well fixed, Mr. Touchett admitted. It's all settled beforehand. They don't leave it to the last moment. I don't like to have everything settled beforehand, said the girl. I like more unexpectedness. Her uncle seemed amused at her distinctness of preference. Well, it's settled beforehand that you'll have great success, he rejoined. I suppose you'll like that. I shall not have success if they're too stupidly conventional. I'm not in the least stupidly conventional. I'm just the contrary. That's what they won't like. No, no, you're all wrong, said the old man. You can't tell what they'll like. They're very inconsistent. That's their principal interest. Ah, well, said Isabel, standing before her uncle, with her hands clasped about the belt of her black dress, and looking up and down the lawn, that will suit me perfectly. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 The two amused themselves time and time again, with talking of the attitude of the British public, as if the young lady had been in a position to appeal to it. But in fact the British public remained for the present profoundly indifferent to Miss Isabel Archer, whose fortune had dropped her, as her cousin said, into the dullest house in England. Her gouty uncle received very little company, and Mrs. Touchett, not having cultivated relations with her husband's neighbours, was not warranted in expecting visits from them. She had, however, a peculiar taste. She liked to receive cards. For what is usually called social intercourse, she had very little relish, but nothing pleased her more than to find her hall-table whitened with oblong morsels of symbolic pasteboard. She flattered herself that she was a very just woman, and had mastered the sovereign truth that nothing in this world is got for nothing. She had played no social part as mistress of Garden Court, and it was not to be supposed that in the surrounding country a minute account should be kept of her comings and goings. But it is by no means certain that she did not feel it to be wrong that so little notice was taken of them, and that her failure, really very gratuitous, to make herself important in the neighbourhood had not much to do with the acrimony of her allusions to her husband's adopted country. Isabel presently found herself in the singular situation of defending the British Constitution against her aunt, Mrs. Touchett having formed the habit of sticking pins into this venerable instrument. Isabel always felt an impulse to pull out the pins, 
not that she imagined they inflicted any damage on the tough old parchment, but because it seemed to her her aunt might make better use of her sharpness. She was very critical herself, it was incidental to her age, her sex, and her nationality, but she was very sentimental as well, and there was something in Mrs. Touchett's dryness that set her own moral fountains flowing. "'Now, what's your point of view?' she asked of her aunt. "'When you criticise everything here, you should have a point of view. Yours doesn't seem to be American. You thought everything over there so disagreeable. When I criticise, I have mine. It's thoroughly American.' "'My dear young lady,' said Mrs. Touchett, there are as many points of view in the world as there are people of sense to take them. You may say that doesn't make them very numerous. American? Never in the world. That's shockingly narrow. My point of view, thank God, is personal. Isabel thought this a better answer than she admitted. It was a tolerable description of her own manner of judging, but it would not have sounded well for her to say so. On the lips of a person less advanced in life, and less enlightened by experience than Mrs. Touchett, such a declaration would savour of immodesty, even of arrogance. She risked it, nevertheless, in talking with Ralph, with whom she talked a great deal, and with whom her conversation was of a sort that gave a large licence to extravagance. Her cousin used, as the phrase is, to chaff her. He very soon established with her a reputation for treating everything as a joke, and he was not a man to neglect the privileges such a reputation conferred. She accused him of an odious want of seriousness, of laughing at all things, beginning with himself. Such slender faculty of reverence as he possessed centred wholly upon his father. For the rest, he exercised his wit indifferently upon his father's son, this gentleman's weak lungs, his useless life, his fantastic mother, his friends, Lord Warburton in special, his adopted and his native country, his charming new-found cousin. I keep a band of music in my ante-room, he once said to her. It has orders to play without stopping. It renders me two excellent services. It keeps the sounds of the world from reaching the private apartments, and it makes the world think that dancing's going on within. It was dance music, indeed, that you usually heard when you came with an earshot of Ralph's band. The liveliest waltzes seemed to float upon the air. Isabel often found herself irritated by this perpetual fiddling. She would have liked to pass through the ante-room, as her cousin called it, and enter the private apartments. It mattered little that he had assured her they were a very dismal place. She would have been glad to undertake to sweep them and set them in order. It was but half hospitality to let her remain outside, to punish him for which Isabel administered innumerable taps with the ferrule of her straight young wit. It must be said that her wit was exercised to a large extent in self-defence, for her cousin amused himself with calling her Columbia, and accusing her of a patriotism so heated that it scorched. He drew a caricature of her, in which she was represented as a very pretty young woman, dressed on the lines of the prevailing fashion, in the folds of the national banner. Isabel's chief dread in life, at this period of her development, was that she should appear narrow-minded. What she feared next afterwards was that she should really be so. But she nevertheless made no scruple of abounding in her cousin's sense, and pretending to sigh for the charms of her native land. She would be as American as it pleased him to regard her, and if he chose to laugh at her, she would give him plenty of occupation. She defended England against his mother, but when Ralph sang its praises, on purpose, as she said, to work her up, she found herself able to differ from him on a variety of points. In fact, the quality of this small, ripe country seemed as sweet to her as the taste of an October pear, and her satisfaction was at the root of the good spirits which enabled her to take her cousin's chaff and return it in kind. If her good humour flagged at moments, it was not because she thought herself ill-used, but because she suddenly felt sorry for Ralph. It seemed to her he was talking as a blind and had little heart in what he said. 
"'I don't know what's the matter with you,' she observed to him once, "'but I suspect you're a great humbug.' "'That's your privilege,' Ralph answered, who had not been used to being so crudely addressed. "'I don't know what you care for. I don't think you care for anything. You don't really care for England when you praise it. You don't care for America even when you pretend to abuse it.' "'I care for nothing but you, dear cousin,' said Ralph. "'If I could believe even that, I should be very glad.' "'Ah, well, I should hope so,' the young man exclaimed." Isabel might have believed it, and not have been far from the truth. He thought a great deal about her, she was constantly present to his mind. At a time when his thoughts had been a good deal of a burden to him, her sudden arrival, which promised nothing, and was an open-handed gift of fate, had refreshed and quickened them, given them wings and something to fly for. Poor Ralph had been for many weeks steeped in melancholy. His outlook, habitually sombre, lay under the shadow of a deeper cloud. He had grown anxious about his father, whose gout, hitherto confined to his legs, had begun to ascend into regions more vital. The old man had been gravely ill in the spring, and the doctors had whispered to Ralph that another attack would be less easy to deal with. Just now he appeared disburdened of pain, but Ralph could not rid himself of a suspicion that this was a subterfuge of the enemy, who was waiting to take him off his guard. If the manoeuvre should succeed, there would be little hope of any great resistance. Ralph had always taken for granted that his father would survive him, that his own name would be the first grimly called. The father and son had been close companions, and the idea of being left alone with the remnant of a tasteless life on his hands was not gratifying to the young man, who had always and tacitly counted upon his elder's help in making the best of a poor business. At the prospect of losing his great motive, Ralph lost indeed his one inspiration. If they might die at the same time, it would be all very well, but without the encouragement of his father's society, he should barely have patience to await his own turn. He had not the incentive of feeling that he was indispensable to his mother. It was a rule with his mother to have no regrets. He bethought himself, of course, that it had been a small kindness to his father to wish that, of the two, the active rather than the passive party should know the felt wound. He remembered that the old man had always treated his own forecast of an early end as a clever fallacy which he should be delighted to discredit so far as he might by dying first. But of the two triumphs, that of refuting a sophistical son, and that of holding on a while longer in a state of being which, with all abatements he enjoyed, Ralph deemed it no sin to hope the latter might be vouchsafed to Mr. Touchett. These were nice questions, but Isabel's arrival put a stop to his puzzling over them. It even suggested that there might be a compensation for the intolerable ennui of surviving his genial sire. He wondered whether he were harbouring love for this spontaneous young woman from Albany, but he judged that on the whole he was not. After he had known her for a week he quite made up his mind to this, and every day he felt a little more sure. Lord Warburton had been right about her. She was a really interesting little figure. Ralph wondered how their neighbour had found it out so soon, and then he said it was only another proof of his friend's high abilities, which he had always greatly admired. If his cousin were to be nothing more than an entertainment to him, Ralph was conscious she was an entertainment of a high order. A character like that, he said to himself, a real little passionate force to see at play, is the finest thing in nature. It's finer than the finest work of art than a Greek bas-relief, than a great Titian, than a Gothic cathedral. It's very pleasant to be so well treated where one had least looked for it. I had never been more blue, more bored, than for a week before she came. I had never expected less that anything pleasant would happen. Suddenly I receive a Titian by the post to hang on my wall, a Greek bas-relief to stick over my chimney-piece. The key of a beautiful edifice is thrust into my hand, 
and i'm told to walk in and admire my poor boy you've been sadly ungrateful and now you had better keep very quiet and never grumble again the sentiment of these reflections was very just but it was not exactly true that ralph touchett had had a key put into his hand his cousin was a very brilliant girl who would take as he said a good deal of knowing but she needed the knowing and his attitude with regard to her though it was contemplative and critical was not judicial he surveyed the edifice from the outside and admired it greatly he looked in at the windows and received an impression of proportions equally fair but he felt that he saw it only by glimpses and that he had not yet stood under the roof the door was fastened and though he had keys in his pocket he had a conviction that none of them would fit she was intelligent and generous it was a fine free nature but what was she going to do with herself the question was irregular for with most women one had no occasion to ask it most women did with themselves nothing at all they waited in attitudes more or less gracefully passive for a man to come that way and furnish them with a destiny isabel's originality was that she gave one an impression of having intentions of her own whenever she executes them said ralph may i be there to see it devolved upon him of course to do the honours of the place mr touchett was confined to his chair and his wife's position was that of a rather grim visitor so that in the line of conduct that opened itself to ralph duty and inclination were harmoniously mixed he was not a great walker but he strolled about the grounds with his cousin a pastime for which the weather remained favourable with a persistency not allowed for in isabel's somewhat lugubrious prevision of the climate and in the long afternoons of which the length was but the measure of her gratified eagerness they took a boat on the river the dear little river as isabel called it where the opposite shore seemed still a part of the foreground of the landscape or drove over the country in a phaeton a low capacious thick-wheeled phaeton formerly much used by mr touchett but which he had now ceased to enjoy isabel enjoyed it largely and handling the reins in a manner which approved itself to the groom as knowing was never weary of driving her uncle's capital horses through winding lanes and byways full of the rural incidents she had confidently expected to find past cottages thatched and timbered past alehouses latticed and sanded past patches of ancient common and glimpses of empty parks between hedgerows made thick by midsummer when they reached home they usually found tea had been served on the lawn and that mrs touchett had not shrunk from the extremity of handing her husband his cup but the two for the most part sat silent the old man with his head back and his eyes closed his wife occupied with her knitting and wearing that appearance of rare profundity with which some ladies consider the movement of their needles one day however a visitor had arrived the two young persons after spending an hour on the river strolled back to the house and perceived lord warburton sitting under the trees and engaged in conversation of which even at a distance the desultory character was appreciable with mrs touchett he had driven over from his own place with a portmanteau and had asked as the father and son often invited him to do for a dinner and a lodging isabel seeing him for half an hour on the day of her arrival had discovered in this brief space that she liked him he had indeed rather sharply registered himself on her fine sense and she had thought of him several times she had hoped she should see him again hoped too that she should see a few others garden court was not dull the place itself was sovereign her uncle was more and more a sort of golden grandfather and ralph was unlike any cousin she had ever encountered her idea of cousins having tended to gloom then her impressions were still so fresh and so quickly renewed that there was as yet hardly a hint of vacancy in the view but isabel had need to remind herself that she was interested in human nature and that her foremost hope in coming abroad had been that she should see a great many people when ralph said to her as he had done several times 
I wonder you find this endurable. You ought to see some of the neighbours, and some of our friends, because we have really got a few, though you would never suppose it. When he offered to invite what he called a lot of people, and make her acquainted with English society, she encouraged the hospitable impulse, and promised in advance to hurl herself into the fray. Little, however, for the present, had come of his offers, and it may be confided to the reader that if the young man delayed to carry them out, it was because he found the labour of providing for his companion by no means so severe as to require extraneous help. Isabel had spoken to him very often about specimens. It was a word that played a considerable part in her vocabulary. She had given him to understand that she wished to see English society illustrated by eminent cases. "'Well, now, there's a specimen,' he said to her, as they walked up from the riverside, and he recognised Lord Warburton. "'A specimen of what?' asked the girl. "'A specimen of an English gentleman.' "'Do you mean they're all like him?' "'Oh, no, they're not all like him.' "'He's a favourable specimen, then,' said Isabel, "'because I'm sure he's nice.' "'Yes, he's very nice, and he's very fortunate.' The fortunate Lord Warburton exchanged a handshake with our heroine, and hoped she was very well. "'But I needn't ask that,' he said, "'since you've been handling the oars.' "'I've been rowing a little,' Isabel answered. "'But how should you know it?' "'Oh, I know he doesn't row. He's too lazy,' said his lordship, indicating Ralph Touchett with a laugh. "'He has a good excuse for his laziness,' Isabel rejoined, lowering her voice a little. "'Ah, he has a good excuse for everything,' cried Lord Warburton, still with his sonorous mirth. "'My excuse for not rowing is that my cousin rows so well,' said Ralph. "'She does everything well. She touches nothing that she doesn't adorn.' "'It makes one want to be touched, Miss Archer,' Lord Warburton declared. "'Be touched in the right sense, and you'll never look the worse for it,' said Isabel, who, if it pleased her to hear it said that her accomplishments were numerous, was happily able to reflect that such complacency was not the indication of a feeble mind, inasmuch as there were several things in which she excelled. Her desire to think well of herself had at least the element of humility that it always needed to be supported by proof. Lord Warburton not only spent the night at Garden Court, but he was persuaded to remain over the second day, and when the second day was ended he determined to postpone his departure till the morrow. During this period he addressed many of his remarks to Isabel, who accepted this evidence of his esteem with a very good grace. She found herself liking him extremely, the first impression he had made on her had had weight, but at the end of an evening spent in his society she scarce fell short of seeing him, though quite without luridity, as a hero of romance. She retired to rest with a sense of good fortune, with a quickened consciousness of possible felicities. "'It's very nice to know two such charming people as those,' she said, meaning by those, her cousin and her cousin's friend. It must be added, moreover, that an incident had occurred which might have seemed to put her good humour to the test. Mr. Touchett went to bed at half-past nine o'clock, but his wife remained in the drawing-room with the other members of the party. She prolonged her vigil for something less than an hour, and then, rising, observed to Isabel that it was time they should bid the gentlemen good night. Isabel had as yet no desire to go to bed. The occasion wore, to her sense, a festive character, and feasts were not in the habit of terminating so early. So without further thought she replied very simply, "'Need I go, dear aunt? I'll come up in half an hour.' "'It's impossible I should wait for you,' Mrs. Touchett answered. "'Ah, oh, you needn't wait. Ralph will light my candle,' Isabel gaily engaged. "'I'll light your candle. Do let me light your candle, Miss Archer.' Lord Warburton exclaimed. Only, I beg, it shall not be before midnight. Mrs. Touchett fixed her bright little eyes upon him a moment, and transferred them coldly to her niece. You can't stay alone with the gentleman. You're not, uh, you're not at your blessed Albany, my dear. Isabel rose, blushing. I wish I were, she said. 
"'Oh, I say, mother,' Ralph broke out. "'My dear Mrs. Touchett,' Lord Warburton murmured. "'I didn't make your country, my lord,' Mrs. Touchett said majestically. "'I must take it as I find it.' "'Can't I stay with my own cousin?' Isabel inquired. "'I'm not aware that Lord Warburton is your cousin.' "'Perhaps I had better go to bed,' the visitor suggested. "'That will arrange it.' Mrs. Touchett gave a little look of despair and sat down again. "'Oh, if it's necessary, I'll stay up till midnight.' Ralph, meanwhile, handed Isabel her candlestick. He had been watching her. It had seemed to him her temper was involved an accident that might be interesting. But if he had expected anything of a flare, he was disappointed, for the girl simply laughed a little, nodded good night, and withdrew, accompanied by her aunt. For himself he was annoyed at his mother, though he thought she was right. Above stairs the two ladies separated at Mrs. Touchett's door. Isabel had said nothing on her way up. "'Of course you're vexed at my interfering with you,' said Mrs. Touchett. Isabel considered. "'I'm not vexed, but I'm surprised, and a good deal mystified. Wasn't it proper I should remain in the drawing-room?' "'Not in the least. Young girls here, in decent houses, don't sit alone with the gentlemen late at night.' "'You were very right to tell me, then,' said Isabel. "'I don't understand it, but I'm very glad to know it. "'I shall always tell you,' her aunt answered, "'whenever I see you taking what seems to me too much liberty. "'Pray do, but I don't say I shall always think your remonstrance just. "'Very likely not. You're too fond of your own ways.' "'Yes, I think I'm very fond of them, "'but I always want to know the things one shouldn't do.' "'So as to do them?' asked her aunt. "'So as to choose,' said Isabel.' End of chapter 7